So if you're stuck in a prisoner's dilemma type situation, if you're Anil and Bala, and you have to figure out the best way to kill the insects that are eating your crops, you both want to hit that 3-3 three, three corner where everybody's happier using kind of the natural solution rather than using the, the harsh insecticide. Um, but without any avenue for cooperation and guaranteeing that one person's gonna make the magic bug choice, um, you're naturally gonna devolve into doing a worse choice. And so guaranteeing cooperation in a land of prisoners' dilemmas, this PD here, is tricky. Um, the only way you can really do it is to um, repeat interactions. Um, this is what you did in the, in the different simulations that you did in the readings for today. Um, where you have different strategies of a whole bunch of simulated um, um, actors in this in this fake simulation. As you keep repeating interactions, then you learn what the other person's going to do. And so if you decide to cooperate once, and then the other person cooperates, then that's a signal that, oh, this person's actually going to keep using their magic bugs or keep doing kind of the good socially optimal thing. And so as you keep repeating that, you can build a relationship with the other person. Even if you can't coordinate with them and talk to them and communicate, you still learn from each other. And so if you can repeat and kind of iterate and then keep figuring out, like, if you go week by week with Anil and Bala, eventually they'll settle on to some outcome, but they'll watch what the other person is doing. Um, and if they see that they're always going to keep using the poison, then um, you're going to keep using the poison. But if you see that they might start experimenting with the bugs, then you can. And if they decide to stop, then you'll stop. And so you have different kind of reactions to their choices. And so if you just have a one-shot game, which means you just meet each other once, you can't talk with each other, um, then you're probably going to end up in a non-cooperative situation where you're both going to defect and it's going to be bad. But if you have a repeated game, um, where they're continually farming and doing new things and interacting with each other, then you're likely to kind of steer upward into the cooperation land and, and you'll have some good cooperation. But that can devolve quickly. If one of them starts defecting, then you'll start defecting as well. Okay, another thing you can do to help guarantee cooperation is to make um, your interactions with people infinite. Um, it's this idea of infinitization where... Um, Technically, what you want to do is if you know that you're just doing a 10 round game, like you have a, a growing season that's only 10 weeks, um, you're going to want to start using the poison because that gives you more benefits. You're going to want to do that in the last possible week, like in week 10, um, because then you're never going to see the person again. And so you might as well cheat them at that point. Um, but if you can get rid of that 10-week that window and just say you're always going to be with this person, then that removes the incentive to cheat at the end. Um, and so that's this idea of this defecting at T, this italic T means time period. So if you have 10, a 10-week 10 growing window, um, somebody is going to defect at week 9. But then that also means the other person is going to assume that they're going to defect at week 9, and so they're also going to defect at week 9, which means you're going to start defecting at week eight because you know they're both going to cheat in the last week. And then you, mo you both know that you're going to cheat in the week before the last week. So you'll start cheating in week seven and then in week six and then week five all the way up to the beginning. And you'll just always cheat and defect. And that's bad. Um, but getting rid of that time limit um, and having it be infinite kind of helps guarantee more cooperation. Um, one issue with this, though, is we actually do see cooperation in the real world. Um, Anil and Bala, this is a, a fake contrived example, but stuff like this happens all the time, um, where you have two people that have to act in the collective benefit of, of their group. Um, the payoffs might be structured in a way that makes it so they'll get more benefit if they cheat and if they defect. Um, but even then, you'll see cooperation. And so one issue I have with with this prisoner's dilemma thing, you'll see it all over the place. Any economics textbook will have a prisoner's dilemma section in it. Any policy analysis textbook that you will have or you have had will have prisoner's dilemma in it. You get prisoner's dilemma all the time. And it's really a hopeless feeling type of game because there's no way to actually land on that 3-3 three, three happy cooperation land where everybody's doing the right thing because the incentives are set up where everybody's going to defect. The only way to get out of that world is to change the rules of the game. Um, that's what you saw with the Golden Balls videos. The only way they could get out of that was by rewriting the rules of the game and saying, I will pay you outside of this game, and then we'll figure out the payoffs there. 
um, which is kind of a sad way of looking at the world. The only way to, to make people cooperate is to not use the system, um, which is kind of helpless feeling. So that is one reason I had you read this article here, this chapter about stag hunts. Um, which is another type of game theory game that it's it's underused in public policy and political science and public administration, but it's actually a really helpful way of looking at the world um, because you can actually end up cooperating in stag hunt situations, but you can also end up defecting. So the reason it's called a stag hunt is because back in England in the 1700s and 1800s, the way you hunted stag was you had a whole bunch of different hunters um, riding through the forest simultaneously, and they all had to coordinate and make sure that they were focusing on this giant um, deer. And if they could all coordinate and work together and not give up, then they were able to take down this deer and everybody could eat lots and lots of food. If one of the hunters or a few of the hunters were riding through the forest and then thought, I don't think we're actually gonna catch this stag today. There's a rabbit, I'm gonna go get that rabbit and just go home and feed my family with the rabbit. Once one person decides to do that, the whole hunt falls apart and nobody's gonna cooperate to hunt stag anymore. And then everybody's gonna need to just go off and get rabbits for themselves and take them back to their homes and nobody's gonna get the stag. So the only way to get the really big payoff of a big deer for the whole group is if everybody keeps cooperating. But as soon as somebody defects, then the whole thing falls apart. Um, so that's, that's the, the story behind the stag hunt idea. The math behind it looks something like this, um, this game theory matrix here, um, where the payoffs here, so if Anil and Bala both decide to hunt stag, whatever that is, um, if it's using specific types of insecticide or, or whatever, um, they both get 10 utils. That's a lot of benefit that they each get if they both cooperate. If they don't, if um, Bala here, or if Anil knows that Bala is hunting stag, um, if we again do the column and row thing, let's ignore the hunting hare thing. So Bala, or Anil knows that Bala is going to hunt stag. He could either get 10 utils if he keeps hunting stag, or if he defects and decides to hunt hare, he'll get two utils. Um, because he'll get stuff for his family. Bala won't get anything, um, but that's not a great option. And so the circle in this situation goes right here. If Anil knows that Bala is going to hunt stag, then Anil is going to hunt stag because that's best for him. That's his best payoff there. Okay, so we put a circle there. Um, on the other hand, if Anil knows that Bala is going to give up and hunt hare, then Anil's best option is to also hunt hare. If he keeps hunting the stag, he's not going to get it, so he's going to get zero points. Um, he wants to hunt hare instead, and so this is going to be his circle here. So he's going to choose to hunt hare. Okay? Um, with Bala, the same situation happens here. If, he, if Bala thinks, Anil is definitely going to hunt stag today, what should I do? Um, the payoffs are either 10 or 2. And so he should hunt stag. But if he knows that Anil is definitely going to give up that day and not hunt stag and just end up hunting hare, then Bala is going to also choose to hunt hare and you're gonna end up in that situation. Which means we have two Nash equilibria again. We have a situation where they can end up hunting stag and making society better off. That's 20 points of happiness to all of society if they can both focus and cooperate and hunt the stag. If they both give up though, then they both get some food, they both get two happiness points, but society only gets four total points instead of 20. So society is much better off if they can end up in this square. Um, but they'll often end up here based on what they're gonna guess the other person does. Um, because again, this is a mixed strategy, and so in their heads they have to kind of read the other person's mind and think, um, Anil's really good at always hunting stag, and so he's not going to give up, so I'm not going to give up. Or if you think, last week Bala gave up, and that sucked, and so maybe this week I'll just give up too, because he's probably going to do it again, then you're, that's going to influence your choice. So the, the reason I like this as a, as a model of social interactions is Prisoner's Dilemma Land says you will always end up here regardless of the payoffs. And in every situation, you're just going to defect and it's going to be sad all the time. Um, what Stag Hunt says is there's actually incentive for people to end up in the cooperate, cooperate square where people are going to both hunt stag. That can happen. That can naturally happen in real life. Um, 
as long as people trust each other. Once you start losing that trust, though, then you end up in the hare hunting land where everybody's defecting. Okay? So in a stag hunt world, you can ensure cooperation without coordinating with people and without um, interacting with people and having infinite repetitions of the game or anything. Um, this is just you have to hope that they're going to cooperate. And if you think the probability is high that they're going to cooperate, then you can cooperate too. Um, so the cool thing about this is the payoffs for cooperation are actually greater than the payoffs for defection. Society is better off if you can both cooperate and there's a reason to cooperate. But at the same time, there's still an incentive to defect. If you think the other person's going to give up and defect and choose the bad option, then you're still going to do that. You're not going to be a sucker and always choose the best option. You're going to also defect. And so this is more reflective of what happens in reality, and it's kind of a better model of, of social dilemmas here. Um, one example of this is with climate change um, and with um, international agreements to, um, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Um, so we saw this with the Kyoto Accords and with the Paris Agreement, um, where countries, if everybody can cooperate and hunt hare or hunt stag and agree collectively to reduce carbon emissions, and if all countries can get on board, then everybody's going to do it and it's going to be a lot more powerful. But if one country decides to hold out and go hunt hare, um, for instance, the United States in 2017, when we pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords, um, that hurts everybody collectively um, because now we're not going to reach that, that, that stag hunting cooperation land where there's great payoffs for everybody because one country defected. And so then other countries have been defecting because they have to go hunt um, hare on their own. And so things fall apart because of that. But had everybody stayed with the cooperate, cooperate square, then the world would have been better off. Arriving on time at like a party, um, this is also a, a, a stag hunt situation um, where if you decide, I want to arrive at this party um, five minutes early, but I don't want to be the only person there, um, you have to hope that other people are going to show up five minutes early. Um, and if everybody shows up five minutes early or directly on time, then everybody's going to be happy and nobody's going to be awkwardly there as the only person at the party initially. Um, but the only way that works is if everybody decides to show up at the same time. But if you, as one person, decide sometimes people are late. And so if I show up right on time, I'm going to be the only person. It's going to be awkward. So I'm going to purposely be five minutes late. Um, that then ruins it for everybody else because people who are planning to be on time so they can be on time for the party, but they also don't want to be awkwardly the only person there, then they're going to purposely be a little bit late. And then everybody's going to start defecting to lateness. Um, and then it gets into a situation where there's more and more lateness. Um, and then people are like an hour late because they don't want to be the first one because they're assuming everybody else is going to defect. So if you can somehow get everybody on board and say, we're officially going to be on time nobody's going to be awkwardly hanging around as the only person, then you can guarantee cooperation. It's better for everybody. Um, which again, is kind of a goofy situation compared to climate change, but it does, um, it reflects the same payoffs where you can have cooperation, but you can also have defection. Um, we see this also in soccer tournaments. Um, the way tournaments like the World Cup works um, in soccer is a winning team in a tournament gets three points, um, not related to the number of goals they get, just kind of three points in the rankings. If uh, there's a tie, then um, th both teams get one point, and if a team loses, then they get zero points. And so what you end up with is you have like groups of teams that compete with each other, they all play with each other, and then the top scoring teams, if you have a group of four, the teams with two, with the, the top two teams that have the highest scores move on to the next round. Um, and so what sometimes happens, um, what often happens, depending on how games are won and lost, is the number one and number two team can often meet each other for the last game of the series of their group of four, and they know that they are both guaranteed to move on to the next round, regardless of which team wins or loses. Like they're, They have enough points to move on. They don't actually need to play very hard as a result because they're both moving on regardless of the outcome of the game. And so there is an incentive there to not play so hard and to kind of take a more relaxing game and to, to not try really hard. 
Um, and this is a, a common fear in, in football tournaments or in soccer tournaments. In the 2014 World Cup, for instance, um, Germany and the United States ran into a situation like this um, where they both were guaranteed to move on to the next round. And so sports commentators in the United States and in Germany were saying they could just like sit down on the field for 90 or yeah, for 90 minutes and just do nothing. And then they'd move on to the next round. There's no reason to exert themselves, to risk getting injured, um, to run too hard and get super tired. There's no reason to do it. They could just kind of not do anything. And at the beginning of the game, in real life, that actually did kind of happen. They weren't playing super hard. They were just kind of kicking the ball around. And so they were in the cooperate, cooperate land um, because there was no, like, the incentives there are let's all cooperate and not try too hard and just kind of get through this so we can move on to the rest of the tournament. Um, but then um, Germany started playing harder and they scored and then the U.S. had to start playing again. Um, and so that's kind of the, the hair hunting situation where they both kind of went and they, they had to play hard and risk injury and it turned into a real game, um, which is more exciting for fans. You don't want to watch people just run around for 90 minutes doing nothing. Um, and so um, that was kind of a good example of a stag hunt situation. Negative political campaigns do the same thing. Um, voters are often um, put, put out by negative campaigns. We don't like seeing negative campaigns. And so if you have two campaigns that both agree to stay positive and to not um, do awful lying um, campaign ads or anything like that, then society as a whole is kind of in a better situation. Everybody's cooperating. And so you're in that stag hunting land where both campaigns are um, sticking to the agreement. But if one of them decides to start hunting hair and going negative, then the other campaign is going to also swing down to negative um, and they'll both start defecting. And so in this situation, you have both types of outcomes. It's not a prisoner's dilemma. They're not always going to permanently, permanently be negative. There is an incentive to be positive. Um, but that incentive only holds if you can trust that the other person is going to hold up their end of the bargain or the other campaign is going to hold up their end of the bargain. And if you don't think they're going to do it, then you're going to defect and then they're going to defect. Um, and so there's a lot more cooperation that is possible and that occurs in real life um, in these stag hunt situations. And it's a lot less helpless feeling than, uh, than a prisoner's dilemma because you can have cooperation. Um, that like the incentives can be structured in a way that makes it so you want to cooperate. And so it's not kind of this helpless, sad prisoner's dilemmas world. Um, so stag hunts are cool. Um, you don't often see them in, in econ classes um, because people don't think about them. But that's why I had you think about them, because they're a neat way of thinking about the world.